All right, so basically, I'm Vijay Gill, and this is Chris Wright. Chris Wright is actually one of the, the engineers who works in the same group as I do, and we are responsible for media access and caching uh, part of the, the network, and I'll explain some of the other parts of the networks as we get to them. Um, so when I started working for AOL, uh, my mom asked and heard, called me up from India and said, hey, I heard you're working for AOL now. What are you doing there? So I was like, hey, mom, you know when you log on to AOL and you have mail and the voice says, you've got mail? Well, guess what? There's a warehouse filled with thousands of people, and I'm one of them. And if you have mail, I speak into this little microphone, you've got mail. <laughs> so it's been two years, and my mom is still trying to like log on to her and check her email and hoping to hear my voice. <laughs> so I think at this point, I should probably tell her that that's not going to happen. It's a pre-recorded voice. But we let it go for now. So we're going to look at the problem space. Um, what we are trying to solve here, because although some of the stuff we do is cool, nobody's really paying us, especially in this environment post-crash, uh, to play with cool stuff. We actually have business problems to solve, and we are looking at them. And AOL has a huge set of networks. We will only focus on streaming and caching portions of that network because, well, that's what we are, uh, our main focus is on. And we will go over the caching and the streaming, not in that order. So this is what the kind of the internet looks like, right? You have the internets, you have the backbone routers, you have like things that connect to data centers. So this is how the thing goes. Do we have a laser pointer, Susan? <laughs> and this time I promise not to shoot muscles in my own eye with my own laser pointer. But so this is the context in which we have engineered and built our data centers. So this is the spatial view of the network. And while you can see the, the scope and size of the network, it's not as interesting as this view, which is actually a utilization and time view of the network. This is far more interesting from an engineering perspective. This is far more interesting from a requirements perspective because you can see if you, if you overlay the census data from last year um, onto this, this map, you will see that the vast majority of the, the user base, so to speak, is either on the California side, the, the left coast, or the right coast for the US, and of course, certain major cities in Europe. So you overlay your spatial build out where to match the population centers. So this is a spatial view. Laser pointer, someone? Anybody? Anyone else? Avi, with your 20 milliwatt? So, if you look at the, the spatial, I mean, sorry, at the utilization and the time view of the network, this is from a tool that is built by some of our uh, internal tool development people. They map uh, various bandwidth utilizations from the network onto this graph. So if you look, look at the network, you will see the red dots and the, the pinkish lines. Those represent high bandwidth um, points in the network or high bandwidth links in the network. So the problem we are trying to solve is to give the best user experience possible with the minimum cost of maintaining that service, because that's the only way you can survive. You have to have the best experience at the minimum cost. So if you look at the bandwidth, we will look at the bandwidth as a, prox as a proxy for cost, because if you run out of bandwidth, you have to incrementally add more circuits, and they cost money. And if you look at the latencies, and I'm only showing a few of them because the rest are relevant, you get the idea. You are looking at latency as a proxy for the user experience. People normally go online and expect it to be fast, and for some definition of fast, the many definitions. And that can, for the first order, can be approximated by the, the RTT, the latency, and the jitter. So this basically, this diagram here sets out our problem space. We want to minimize our cost and provide the best user experience within those parameters. Of course, in 99, we just had to provide the best user experience without regard to cost. Unfortunately, those days are long gone. So 
Then we look at our major peering points, and those peering points gen normally jump out as things that you want to push content to. Because what we're looking at here is something that people like FedEx, Walmart, Amazon.com have been doing for years. Basically, what you're looking at is a large operations research problem in optimizing your cost of goods distributed. And in this case, we are not pushing um, parcels or we are not shipping parcels. We are not moving goods around internally. We are just pushing packets. But the same equations, the same operations research principles can be applied to the network. So if you look at the network, you will see certain, and this is a very small multivariable problem. It's, we have been doing it um, intuitively in some cases. I mean, this, this is actually a very fairly small network if you look at it. Um, in number of like the variables we have to optimize for. So most of the stuff we can do intuitively, like this looks like a good place, and we'll get approximately close to the correct answer. And sometimes we apply a little more uh, research into it, and we optimize the network based on that. So basically, the solution, given, uh, given the solution space, now we have an answer. What we want to do is we want to distribute the thing that costs us money, which is bits, as close to the user as possible. This optimizes two things. This reduces our overall bits carried on the network, reducing cost, and improves the user experience, leading to a better service. Hey, Susan. I'm going to point it away from me because I don't want to get shot. Ah, this one's better. Uh, whoever it is, like, catch me afterwards, I'll otherwise probably walk off with it. So, what we're trying to do is we're trying to distribute the right content to the right place. Basically, try to take the content from our data centers and push it out as close to the user as possible uh, using various techniques such as uh, content distribution networks, distributed IPTs, and distributed caches, because cache is content. I'm mean, sorry, uh, web pages are content. And things like we've developed in house, like the Ultravox. And we'll go more into detail later. And of course, obviously, the best place to put content, cache it, is on the user's PC directly. Because, well, your RTT is almost zero. And so we, there are things like AOL uh, Top Speed, which is one of the products we sell, uh, which actually reside and do a much better caching job on the user's PC than, say, the def default program uh, given to us by Bill. So having said that, this is what a functional breakdown of an AOL data center looks like. Keep in mind, this is not necessarily the topologically correct uh, view. This is basically functional. Um, I will be focusing on the two red circles here, which is basically streaming networks and the web cache uh, networks. Uh, each one of these little silos here could take up an entire presentation of like an hour. What is extremely interesting, and which unfortunately I don't have time to go into today, is the Oscar Boss complex. The Oscar Boss complex supports AIM. And the amount of engineering and packets per second flying around inside Oscar is actually stupendous. Uh, unfortunately, we will not be able to get to those. So basically, data center design philosophy. The entire data center is in-sourced, so to speak. Chris, myself, James, I know he's walking around here somewhere. This group, Watson, we all engineered this. This is engineered in, within our um, John Chance's organization, who is our uh, SVP, I believe. And it's designed, implemented, and operated in-house. There's no external organization that touches this. So we own it end-to-end, -end, which has some optimizations, because now we can make sure that the thing is done right. It has some problems in that if stuff breaks, we are responsible for it. Ideally, we want the, the, the responsibility without any, any blame, but can't have it all. Um, so basically, the network is, it, it looks like a fractal, if you would. Every component inside, we try to like dual home, uh, have two of each. And then the paths, we have redundant paths. And then at the top level, we have redundant data center. So we can lose any cluster and migrate the users either transparently, for example, with Oscar or Boss, or uh, redirecting in DNS rotors for other stuff into something that is um, still up. We are also not a big fan of VLANs. We are not a big fan of VTP. We are not a big fan of layer two networks in general. They tend to cause more problems than they solve in our experience. So we basically try to stick to layer three and above as much as possible. Is Richard Colella in here? Oh, 
if he was, you would have asked him about some of the, the ATM bridging stuff. Um, and eventually, we come to system review. This is a very important part of AOL. We go through the backbone, we go through data centers, and we review our current bandwidth utilizations, our current member counts, and see what, what would happen if X components failed. We just normally look at the components and we just take a bunch of clusters out and see if we can map the remaining capacity we have available onto the demand. So this is what the data center clusters in Northern Virginia look like. Uh, there is a reason the, you can't put them up here. There's nothing visible because to actually really see them, you would need a, a plotter sheet about the size of this table wide and about this long so you can read what's on the, on the things. So this is the context of the AOL data center. And if you take the data center cluster out, we will only focus on, on the cache part, which is this like block box over there, and the streaming networks. Uh, some of the networks down below uh, represent uh, the Oscar complexes, which give you some idea of what, uh, what the network looks like. So caching. So when AOL was started out, Um, the users were terminated on these complexes, like the, the dot complex, the pods, and each one of these systems was designed to support X number of users. And of course, X changed as the capacity of the system increased as we got better uh, CPU, better, more horsepower in the boxes. The problem with this architecture was that it was fixed. So each switch each cluster supported a fixed number of users, and the problem with that was you couldn't scale systems that were running out of capacity. Now, of course, the simple answer is why don't we throw out some of the, say, for example, we ran out of DNS. Why don't we throw out the DNS switch uh, boxes and replace them with faster um, CPU, which is normally the approach you would look at from a theoretical perspective. Unfortunately, our financial uh, planning people would shoot us if we tried to do that because we have lease cycles, we have uh, amortization schedules that we have to adhere to, so we just couldn't, for example, throw out a couple of boxes and replace them with faster boxes. So basically, whenever we had to build more capacity, we had to build a node. So we built on a, the unit of maintenance, the unit of construction to support a user was a node, and so we had to build that node out. And so the solution was decouple each service from the fixed nodal architecture into a farm, so to speak, where you farm out different services, for example, DNS farms, caching farms, and as each cluster of each particular service ran out of capacity, you would just add more uh, hosts there. Much, much easier to do than trying to swap in lease, uh, swap in flight uh, machines that were on lease return. So basically, we decoupled uh, service growth from our nodal architecture. So this is the farm design. So you have the so you have the farm. You have the the, the web cache routers up top, and each of these little boxes now silos provide a service, and you can basically arbitrarily scale each one of these in any dimension that you need in terms of CPU, memory, or um, or space, and I'll go more into detail in a second here. So this is what the new web cache architecture looks like. Keep in mind that this is like a dot on the big green map that I showed earlier. So you have the IPD farms, which are the tunnels which terminate the AOL user, uh, the tunnel users that is, and you have a whole bunch of them. I, I have removed significant amounts of information from the slide in interests of uh, visibility, so to speak. But there's a whole cluster of these. Um, these, the AOL user comes in, terminates on one of these, these farms, and then they do, uh, these clusters provide the, the various services that we need. And I think we have some of the IA people here who, who actually run the, the hosts over here and, and that they do the scaling stuff. So all in all, this cluster here serves about 13 billion requests a day, which is a fairly decent amount of requests to do, I would say. And hanging over here, 
is, is the ultra vox, which is eight by giggy. Each one of these links is uh, four by gigs. And we'll go into the ultra vox in the streaming part. So taking an example of how, and in the interest of time, I'm only going to go into the DNS part of the, of the design. So this picture ripped wholesale from the IA web page is actually here. So the user comes in, he makes a request to the, the IPT farm switches, which are those switches here, these. And the farm switches then load balance. They, there's a virtual um, DNS server, virtual DNS server address sitting at, at a layer four on, on the, the farm switches. You send a request to the farm switches, and there's, of course, things like layer four nothing in reverse and forward direction happening, but I'm just not going to go into them because I don't want people's head to explode. So you make a request to the DNS farm switches. The DNS farm switches will load balance the request uh, with a, using a round robin predictor onto the barn switches. There are two barn switches, as we've seen here, uh, barn A, barn B. Uh, and the barn A and barn B switches then do a new foundry technique called the stateless uh, load balancing. And they will spray that request, regardless of uh, uh, source and destination IP, across the farm of DNS servers. And we've been trying this out, and this actually leads to a, such an even load distribution that if you look at it in, in one of our graphing tools, you cannot tell the, each server from one server from the other because all the lines are coincident upon each other. This is almost 100% the holy grail of load balancing. So now, of course, billions of DNS requests come in from AOL people. They all get served across the DNS farms. And keep in mind, this is a cluster. There are many other clusters like it. This one is mine. Um, I wonder if people caught that reference. Some, some did. Um, so that then does the DNS server uh, uh, implementation. Of course, the same technique is also applied to uh, modulo like stateful things like TCP across web caching. And so basically, now we can scale any of these in arbitrary dimensions that we require. Now, streaming, that was caching. Let's take a look at streaming. Uh, streaming, a simplified view, consists of three blocks. You have the unified storage, where basically you take all your, this is the repository for all your content. You have hundreds of gigabytes, terabytes, I don't even know how much, I don't even want to know how much, because storage is expensive, put into the unified storage complex. The unified storage complex is um, actually then split it out to the content distribution network which comprises, for the purpose of the stock, of two pieces, uh, the UltraVox and Nets, uh, uh, Nullsoft Video people. Net, uh, the Nullsoft Video people do things like uh, clips and on-demand content. UltraVox does things like streaming. Shoutcast, for example, if you listen to almost any Shoutcast, AOL Radio, um, Radio at Netscape, they're all coming from uh, the UVox. So basically, the UVox is a set of is a set of protocols, set of hardware, and again, it's a full presentation. If you want me to go into that, we will just stick with the with UVox for now. Um, so the data is put into whatever format, real, null soft, uh, MP3, and it's put into the repository. The ultravoxes, uh, the bedrocks, pull it out from the uni unified storage complex, encode it in ultravox, send it to the ultravox servers. And then, of course, when you click on a web page or something or listen to Shoutcast, it goes to the nearest ultra box using a magical technique called multi-TCP for now, and you're good to go. And I just put the NSAW, uh, the Nullsoft video up here because I wanted to say send it to Deathstar because that's the code name for one of our uh, uh, live content servers. So this is what the cluster looks like. Uh, this is a mini data center in Chicago where basically this is part of the optimization for time and optimization for bandwidth. You take this stuff and then you push it out to the edges where the major peering points are. And if you look back at the slides, you'll see Chicago's one of the major peering points. So you have ATDN, you have peers coming off these routers. Peers go off these routers. You have a router there. You have UltraVox, which at this point consists of uh, specialized hardware which fetches content and then does a unicast replication um, split. I wonder if Dave Meyer is here. No, we're not going to use multicast for this. Um, and now soft video. This is the Death Star complex. So for example, if you click on CNN and you want to see a video, 
or a news clip. Um, that is served off of uh, the, the Death Star complexes. This over here, and we'll go into this in more detail, is the unified storage complex, which consists of some arrays. Um, we'll go more into detail. The systems that push content into the arrays, there's fiber channel over IP replication across to the West Coast, and then you have the same information happening there. So basically, they're synchronized over FCIP. So we have encoders on both coasts that dump data into the repository, and it's magically synced across to either, uh, either coast. So this is what a unified storage complex looks like. So you have um, some magical method of getting data into the repository. The repository is then synced across to the other repositories. And when people like Death Star, people like Ultravox want content, somebody goes and joins, for example, and want, wants to watch a, a video clip, they go to the, the Death Star. The Death Star then does a web NFS a load balance to request to one of these servers, which are, whichever one's available, and then the closest one, and then you dump it, dump that clip over to the Death Star, and then the Death Star rep sends it out to the user. So what, the, what, what this means is that you have things like speeches and, con and, and video clips, trailers that people want to see that would, if we unicast split them from the data centers, would take up terabytes of bandwidth. Now we only send out one, two, ten copies, and we replicate them 100, 200, 300,000 times at each edge. So this is a huge, huge gain on uh, statistical multiplexing. Then, of course, there's things like live content, which is always painful to do no matter where you are. This has never been easy. Um, so we have this thing called the Broadcast Operation Center. So a lot of live content is encoded in the box, and then you send it out to the unified complexes. And then within the unified complexes, we actually do some kind of multicast. This should make Dave slightly happy. And the multicast is only act to act as a transport bus within the data center. It never leaves the cluster of hosts that it is connected to. For example, let's take the, a large news corporation. This is not CNN, by the way, uh, just so that you know. Um, each, the, the news corporation encodes their data, and they send it out in two or three bit rates, just using two here. And then we put it to the transmitters. Here we go. So this is a large news site. They encode their, their uh, content send it over the backbone into these live transmitters. These live transmitters collate and then send the data into the distributed streaming on the unified storage complexes, uh, which are distributed around the, around the backbone. And then, of course, those put it in the repository and then out, out to the end users. So this is what the box looks like. How are we doing on time, Susan? Oh, well, I'll, I'll hurry up. I know people are hungry. I'm. So this is what the box looks like, and again, the problem with this is that this, the density of information is high enough that you really can't see anything, so you just have to go by what I say. Uh, a lot of these hosts do encoding. There's monitoring, so you monitor the video streams, you monitor the encoders. You put stuff into the into the unified storage complexes, and then you push it out from there. So this is basically the nerve centers, so to speak, of the AOL streaming complexes. So any questions? And before this sounds like a Oscar speech, I would really like to say this is a very large and very complex operation. No single person or even single group of people can do this. So some of these people are here. I would really like to thank them. Some of these are actually here. There's James Watson, Terry. Watson, Terry, raise your hands. These are some of the engineers that work on this and make this a reality. This is a major pain to operate, run, and, and design for. And there's a lot of hard work that goes into this. I'd like to give my thanks to these people. And yesterday, while actually most of us engineers were standing outside of the AOL party, the soiree, we were handing out those USB key thingies. Did everybody get the USB key thingies? And there are a group of uh, people, like Nanak people, walked by, and I overheard some of them talk, and they're like, who are these people? And one of the, one of the person in the group replied, oh, they must be the, the marketing guys. So for you guys, 
This is not sales and marketing. We were actually engineers doing the sales and marketing job yesterday. And I'll end with a final quote, which uh, I promised the Amazon guys I would show. Questions? Avi? What issues did you have uh, with authentication? Sorry. What issues did you have with authentication when you start caching streams, uh, you know, streaming objects, uh, with sites that you know are doing user authentication or things like that? Yes, there are. Um, uh, I'm not going to go into that. It's, just, it's extremely complicated. But yes, we have authentication issues. We have solved them. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say, because I didn't go into that, what exactly we use. Because some of that is IP that we are we have surrounded by by legal fences. Okay, that's a part just, of the program. That seems like one of the tricky, you know, complications. Yes, I mean, like actually, let me give you a little hint of some of the stuff. So when I was saying that there's all kinds of reverse natting. Uh, and forward netting happening here in the IPD farm switches. The, are you familiar with the AOL concept of DAHA, which is the dynamically assigned host address? Okay, basically when you connect, you get two IP addresses. You get your IP address on the RAS when you dial up. And then when you connect to the AOL service and you authenticate, you also get another IP address inside the tunnel, which is known as the DAHA. And the problem with the DAHA is now that you're running the DAHA, the tunnel, into the IPT tunnels, which de-encapsulate the AOL protocols and then expose IP. And then they use the DAHA to do the authentication inside the complex. The problem with that is that the request came in from a RAS IP address. You're operating on the DAHA. Now you have to maintain a mapping between the RAS IP address and the DAHA. And that is some of the, the tricky IP property that is, is fenced around by, by legal issues. So unfortunately, I cannot go into that. Yeah, Spencer Dawkins, uh, you were talking about using multicast within uh, data centers. Yes. Uh, is that like? Uh, I was just curious what kind of what kind of order of magnitude you were talking about on receivers for that. No, so basically it's it's very small, really. Of course. Is this on? Yeah. The multicast itself um, within the data center is. Not that large of a magnitude, but it, what it does is saves us from having to replicate, uh, you know, thousands of unicast streams to all of the edges to replicate it. So it, it is very helpful. Essentially, a multicast is a data bus, it's a data transport bus inside the thing. If you really want to know about multicast, I was just talking to the Amazon people who I believe run. Is Ed here? There's Ed. Ed, Ed runs probably one of the largest uh, SCOM and GE multicast networks in the world at this point. I would imagine he would be a much better person to talk about this in the Any other questions? Going, going, gone. Thank you.